So, folks, you are listening to a chatter fact. As always, these are not interviews. These are conversations. And during these uh, strange times, Tom, I've done Zoom. Then we chatted via the airwaves with the bare naked ladies, uh, Jim Cregan. And this is another attempt to uh, <laughs> to work within this odd climate. We are outside. And Beautiful day. Yeah, right? Outside, the sun's shining and also beating down on my head, turning it into a skillet, a bald-headed skillet. I thought that there'd be, you know, raccoons scampering, and I thought that there would be birds singing, but instead I had to compete with uh, some guy in a lawnmower right next door. There are a few birds. <laughs> there are a few birds. But we are outdoors, uh, socially distanced, and we have Mr. Tom Lounges on the show. Folks, this is um, this is a long time coming. This is a legend. This is a legend. This is... Um, a man who I first met in a r- small record store. It wasn't that small, actually, in Hammond, Indiana. It was Woodmar Records. Mm-hmm. And I met you there, and I love the fact that I'm finally getting you on the mic as you are about to open a brand spanking new record store. That's amazing yeah. to me, you know? But, folks, not only is this a man who has paid attention to vinyl, tape, digital, all forms of music Let's he's not kept up. A-track. Yeah, not forget 8-track. <laughs> Not all, the, the, in, in every town and every city and every region, there has to be somebody who champions the local musician as well as just music in general from a worldwide stance, and that's who Tom Lounges is. Tom Lounges is a guy that would talk to a prince, would talk to a huge celebrity, but then at the same time, after he's spoken to you know Alice Cooper, he's going to do a review on, on a local band, and he's going to push local artists. So uh, to have champions like that, instead of the guy who's just looking for the big interview, but somebody who generally cares about musicians and music, uh, no matter how big or small, that's what makes me honor you in a way that, um, that I would not honor most other people in the industry. You know? so, Thank you. So this is a person who's championed musicians. So musicians and people who just want to champion anything that's, that runs the gamut of big or small, listen to this guy's story, because that's where we're going. So Tom Lounge, just say hello to the audience. Hello, audience. This hello, is, Cleveland. So this <laughs> is huge. You know, and you're one of the first people to, to talk to Prince. Right. What it was a it was a radio show? Is that it what that was, was uh, for print, actually for print. And okay. I wound up selling that story. I was one of the last interviews he did on tape, and then he went into a kind of a quiet mode. Uh-huh. And then after that, of course, he broke big. And then after that, he went into the symbol mode. I mean, Prince yeah. was a a diverse person. He was everyone's artist. Prince was a genius yeah. in much the same way Hendrix was. His music touched everyone, and uh, we saw that early on. And I went to the show to review the show and wound up getting an interview with him. And for a split second, got to work security for him. And it's an interesting story in itself. <laughs> what? Uh, if you go to the record bin in Hobart, you'll see a signed security pass, my, my Prince security pass with my Prince backstage pass uh-huh. with a framed copy of one of the national features I did on him, all in a, in a shadow box. <laughs> And it's kind of an interesting story. It was uh, early on in my career. I was working with uh, Hegwish Records and Night Rock News. I was the editor of Night Rock News. And uh, one of my co-writers and I went. He was actually the disco section. Remember disco? Uh, We had a small disco section in the magazine. So he went with me. And he actually introduced me to the music of Prince early on. And so we had this opportunity to go to the show. It was at the uh, Uptown Theater. And if you remember, it was the Dirty Mind Tour, and the single was called Uptown. So mm-hmm. there was a really coolness about that. Tina Marie was the opening act, and uh, it was primarily an African-American audience. Uh, he had not crossed over yet. Prince had not even come close to crossing over on the Dirty Mind Tour. And uh, it was kind of interesting, because we went backstage uh, after the show. Or was it before the show? We went back before the show, and... Um, we were set to do the interview, but he wasn't quite ready yet. So we were asked to wait in the hallway. Well, as we're waiting in the hallway, waiting for our time to have an audience with Prince, which I think we had 10 or 15 minutes with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're, there was a, th- at the same time, I was also working in a nightclub called Point East. And there was different security guys. And, and I had done shows at Hammond Civic Center and some of these other things through Night Rock and Hegwish. So I knew a lot of security guys from Celebration Flipside, from Jam, all these different concert uh, promoters. So long story short, there was some kind of skirmish at the door about something. I don't know what it was. It turned out to be nothing major. But the guy that was in the hallway said, hey, Tom, can you do me a favor? Can you stand by Prince's door and make sure nobody bothers him? 
So I went from being the interviewer to suddenly being his personal security. <laughs> and he slaps a security pass on me and says, just stand here for a few minutes. Nobody in, nobody out. I'm like, okay. So uh, 10 minutes pass, and he comes back. He goes, uh, it turned out to be nothing, and I got to keep my pass. Um, <laughs> so then it was like, okay, five minutes after that, the door opens, and Prince is like, you know, I've got some time. So we came in, and he would not allow us to take pictures, but he was happy to sign my pass and, uh, and uh, any photos or anything we had at the time. But we sat down and did an interview with him for probably about 15 minutes or so. Mm-hmm. And what sucks about that, can I say sucks on yeah, this? Yeah, you can what say whatever you want. What sucks about this is that uh, <laughs> it was the middle of winter. So back then in those cavernous arenas, it was colder than a well diggers, you know what. Oh. So they had one of those heating units that kind of sound like a jet engine. It goes, and then it stopped. And it goes, well, Prince was soft spoken. So 90% of my interview was because it kept kicking on. <laughs> oh, no. So fortunately, I'm taking notes. My interview tape is pretty well non-existent. I still own it. I still have it. You can hear the occasional word here or there. Yeah. But it, uh, it was rough. You know, so I could never use that for interview, for radio. Good job for your, but, uh, good for your journalistic skills, though, being able to write so fast. Oh, and, yeah. Well, know. when I started, I mean, that's what I did. As I, I hand-wrote everything in those little... Because when I started with the Times, they gave you those little journalism uh, mini things that flip over yeah, and you see the, little, TV, pad. the yeah. little pads, but they're made for journalists. So I was pretty quick at making my own shorthand. Really? So I was able to quote, you know, and a lot of times certain quotes you really want to get perfect. So that that's where you kind of run into a snafu is you're just saying, hold that thought. Let me write that down. Okay. Uh, so that was kind of an interesting an interesting experience Tell me working this. with Prince. Uh, coming from that background, because uh, that, that's kind of the, the old school, you know, mm-hmm. n- now you see everybody with their digital recorders. Right. Do you ever revert to that if you're on a phone interview or anything? Do you ever uh, sometimes I make still, notes. You still jot down? Yeah, just, I make notes from time to time. I wondered if that ever, you know, feels comfortable because you hear about the screenwriters or I, I think Sylvester Stallone, I just heard him talking about how he, he still hand writes mm-hmm. a lot of his scripts. It's just in notebooks. And I didn't know if... I, I do. I do make a lot of notes. And, and to tell you how paranoid i am of technology (laughs) when the digital recorders came out i would take the digital recorder knowing it would fail and because i'm an inept operator and i would also take a cassette recorder and i would set the little cassette recorder up as a backup and i still would do notes a little bit on the side but i would i would have the tape and i would have the digital and i've gotten to the point now where i'm comfortable if i have to do a remote interview to use the digital but for the most part, my interviews now are on radio, on microphone, like we're doing here, where I'm recording it on a laptop. Yeah. In fact, tell everybody where they can find all of your shows. Well, the shows, uh, not all of them, but a good chunk of them are at Lakeshore Public Media. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, take that back. LakeshorePublicRadio.org. LakeshorePublicRadio.org. Uh, that is the website for NPR in our local station. And if you go under Programs to Music... I'm the first one listed, Midwest Beat. And then you click on that, and you can go all the way back through to several years. And talk about the app, because that worked really well for me. The re- uh, well, that's the, that's the internet station. Yeah. So that, if you go through the Region Radio app, there, you can but also that's find... that's Region Radio versus Lakeshore. Okay. Cause Lakeshore you, is where all the interviews are. Oh, I see. I region see. Radio is our internet station. So uh-huh. we have several, with Region Radio, there's several different uh, genres. Mm-hmm. I happen to have the underground rock, uh, deep cuts, local stuff there. Oh, good to know. Okay, cool. Yeah, so right, it's so two sh- different radio shows completely. So here's the thing. You, you know, you, you've you got the journalistic side. You're running a record store, and I'm talking about, like, in the past now, not mm-hmm. even the, the current record store. <clears throat> you know, and, and then you're, wor- you're working the concert scene. You know, now you've promoted shows, and there's so much. You're so embedded in the music world. So... When does a bug like that hit you? What, what happened? Let's go back to Little Tommy. Like, was there, did you want to be a musician or was no. there a love? Well, yes, I did want to be a musician. And okay. my dad was a white collar business banker. Where'd you grow up? In Highland. Okay. And my Highland, dad Indiana, was, folks. Yeah, Highland, Indiana. And my dad was vice president uh, of a bank, you know, chain of banks and stuff. So back then in the 60s and the early 70s, you know, I said, hey, I want to play guitar. I want to play drums. I want to do this. And he's like, really? He's like, there's no future in that. Go to college, learn algebra, do this, do that, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) And I was a terrible student. I was a terrible student. (laughs) So needless to say, I never did take lessons. And and not to knock my dad in any way, but back then, music wasn't a viable career. 
you know, and my sisters went into business and things, and here I am, you know, well, I don't know what I want to do, yeah. you know, so long story short, I really had no goals at all <laughs> <laughs> until my junior year, and my junior year, I happened to be forced to take a class, uh, Highland at the time, and it only lasted two years, called uh, Radio Television Communications, it was a, a one semester class, mm-hmm. and you had to take it. And again, I always believe that things happen in your life for a reason. People come into your life at right times for a reason. I'm a big karma kind of guy. And this teacher came in, and again, this class lasted two years in the history of Highland High School. I happened to be the first year. And it was called Radio Television Communications, and the the teacher's name was Joe Fetty. So I went into this class, a 'er ne'er-do-well, leather jacket, Cleats on my beetle boots, you know, <laughs> have no intention of doing anything. And I'm doodling all the time. I'm doodling the KISS logo, the Aerosmith logo, the Average White Band logo, you know, all this kind of stuff. I'm just kind of doing nothing, just coexisting, not causing problems, but just coasting. And uh, he starts, we start getting into the class and doing public speaking and all this. And I just really wasn't comfortable. I was very introverted. So, uh, at one point, he goes, well, Mr. Lounges, what are you going to do with your life? What do you want to do? I said, I don't know. He goes, well, what are you interested in? I said, I don't know. And he's like, well, you're writing all these band things down. Those are bands, right? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, do you like music? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, be a musician. I said, I have no talent. <laughs> and I really, I had no talent. I tried singing for a while, and that I can do a little bit of rockabilly, and, but the thing is, I can't remember lyrics. I don't know how you guys do it, <laughs> because if I don't have a cheat sheet, I can't remember anything. <laughs> I know one song by memory, and uh, that's Johnny B. Good. So, uh, because I've done it so many times, but it's interesting because, uh, he said, well, what about radio? I said, yeah, I like radio. And he's like, well, who are your favorite jocks? Well, at the time it was Larry Lujak and Bob Surratt were the two big ones on LS and CFL. And I said, Larry Lujak's the man. I mean, he is really cool. And he goes, well, why don't you find out how he did it? And I said, I'm not going to ever be Larry Lujak. And he said, why not? And I said, well, maybe I could be Larry Lujak. <laughs> Yeah, you know, he was one of those That's teachers that, pep talk that challenged you. Yeah, but, but let you make your decisions. He dropped that seed and then walk away. And the next day he would sprinkle a little water on that seed, and eventually it would grow. I like when somebody has a talent to not necessarily do the Mike Ditka, you know, locker room speech so yep. much as just kind of nudge. I love that his entire inspirational speech to you was, "Well, why not?" And you yeah. thought, "Oh, wait, maybe well, I will. Maybe I could." Yeah. <laughs> so the it's time kick, savers. The kick in the is. butt happened when I came in one day. And he had a copy of Larry Lujak's book, Super Jock. It's a canary yellow cover, book, you know, paper cover on it. I'll never forget that. He put it on there. He goes, I saw this. I thought maybe you'd want to read it. And I thought, okay, looking back now, this was a well-oiled machine, a well-laid plan by this man to make something of me. And uh, I read the book. Well... The following year, now back then, mind you, now anyone can do podcasts, can go on the radio. There is no criteria. Right. Back then, you needed to have a license, just like a pilot or a driving license. You had to have a government-issued license to turn a microphone on, just to touch a board. Which makes me feel like a couple of podcasters or YouTubers should probably and need I licenses still, as well. And honestly, <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to diss anyone in today's broadcast world, but right. honestly, that's why radio in so many ways sucks. Uh-huh. Because it stopped being about the individual. Like, the jocks I grew up with, created their own bits, picked their own music. I mean, Dick Biondi broke the Beatles. Uh, Ron Britton broke Jefferson Airplane and Moby Grape and all these out of Chicago. You know, if you go back to the 60s with the Buckinghams, the Ides of March and all these great bands, it was the local stations because the jocks picked them. Now you got a bean counter in Boston telling you how to program in Highland, Indiana. That is interesting. And it's destroyed radio, in my I, opinion. I've often heard tales of many famous artists or famous songs that, oh, maybe it was a B-side or something, but mm-hmm. I've heard so many tales of you know the random DJ that thought, oh, let me just give this a go. Yeah. And then the phones start ringing, the people talk. Exactly. And then and something's I can tell you a, a local national... story tied to that. Really? In just a bit. Okay. Uh, but to going back to that, I, had a, I took my senior year by that, but by now I'm a senior. And I'd already been inspired by this man. I I aced his class. I got up. I started doing my own radio segments. We'd do little pretend shows. And I would do, uh, my friend Kevin and I did a like a modern hippie version, I guess you'd say, of uh, Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. 
Mm-hmm. And I almost got expelled for it because I knew you couldn't smoke weed, but we had or tobacco for that matter. But I had a corn cob pipe, and I thought realism. You know, it's all about realism. So I took my corn cob pipe and I put Lipton tea in it. And I lit it in class. And you're not allowed to light anything in school, I found out. So I almost got expelled for lighting Lipton tea in this skit because I wanted the realism, you know. <laughs> Going back to that Lee Strasberg kind of method acting thing. So uh, anyway, long story short, I, I aced the class. I was inspired. I left that class after six months inspired with, with a goal. I wanted to be on radio. Wow. So my senior year, while all my friends were partying on spring break, I sat at home and started studying transmitter law, how sine waves work, how this works, how that works, the dustiest, boringest stuff you'd ever want to read. And I learned it, and then I went to the Dirksen building downtown, and I passed my FCC license. I still have it in a book today. It expired in 1983. (laughs) But it expired at a time when I didn't have to renew it anymore because they had already, you know, washed out all that. Uh Uh-huh. So it became uh, passe. But I actually busted my ass for the first time in my life to get that license. He put that goal there. He dangled the carrot and challenged me, this teacher. So, And he comes back into my life later. Um, So I went on and I had my license. Okay, I'm going to be Larry Lujak. Yeah! (laughs) Well, guess what? I had no experience. Just like any other job, you go there and say, well, what's your experience? Well, I don't have any, but I have a license. Yeah, okay, fine. Call me in about 10 years after you've had a few shifts. <laughs> so long story short, I tried everywhere. I went to Hegwish, which is just starting Night Rock. Now, Night Rock had... Uh, and folks, Hegwish is just outside of Chicago, Hegwish, Illinois. And the Hegwish Record Store started there. I, w- I-, I went to work at Calumet City's Hegwish Records on Torrance. And I was working there, and Joe uh, and the store were sponsoring Night Rock Radio, which actually started, if memory serves me well, uh, at 106 FM WLNR, right off of Torrance in Lansing. That's the original home for it. Mm -hmm. And they had people like Chris Eric Stevens, who later went on to WLS, and Bobby Scafish, and people like that were actually the earliest founders of Night Rock. Nobody wanted to hire me even there. I'm like, local rock stations still can't get a job. So uh, I went to LNR. My dad, who wanted to give me every chance I could get, even though he still thought this was a step above being a musician, but not much, uh, <laughs> got me a job, uh, knew the news director, so got my foot in the door. And then I started doing news, and then I started engineering black gospel. Uh-huh. So I would do overnights with, with a guy named Reverend Harold Patton. Whoa. I forget what local church he was with. So we would, uh, I would do midnights, and he would come in, and it was such an eye-opening experience for a white kid from Highland, Indiana. Really? We, we were not diverse in our community. Um, I had never really interacted with, with the African the American. American culture. Oh, okay. Now, I loved certain artists, you know, but I didn't know anything about them. With me, I knew it didn't start with Elvis, but I knew rock and roll kind of started with Elvis. Yeah. And Little Richard and Jerry Lee and stuff. Well, I went in there and I was reading a book on the Rolling Stones. And the Reverend Harold Patton comes up and he goes, what are you reading? I said, a rock and roll book. You know, he goes, oh, you like rock and roll? I said, yeah. He goes, you know where rock and roll started, right? I said, yeah. Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis, Memphis, Sun Records. He's like, boy, you need to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> he introduced me in the off hours before and after the show. He would introduce me to the history of black music, starting with Thomas A. Dorsey, the godfather of gospel, who was based in Chicago. Wow. Not Tommy Dorsey, Thomas A. Dorsey. Uh, who Billy Shelton from the Spaniels uh, actually sang Happy Birthday to him when he was a child. Oh, wow, so really? So ask Billy about that on your podcast nice. next time he's on. You That's a know, great story. You guys know Billy. <laughs> Billy is from the Spaniels, of course. Yeah. Um, so Thomas A. Dorsey, then we started spinning records as his engineer. I became his engineer, Harold Patton's. And uh, I started playing Mighty Clouds of Joy, Andre Crouch and the Disciples, you know, the Staple Singers, some great, great black gospel music. Wow. And in between all that, I was learning about Miles Davis, Quincy Jones, uh, Robert Johnson, uh, all these old cats, you know, Louis Armstrong. Yeah. And through him, I started reading up. Again, he put the little seeds and they walk away. It's a different guy, same, same style. And I started reading up on it because I wanted to know more. I wanted to be able to turn that mic on and act like I knew something, nice. even though it wasn't my culture. 
And uh, I did that for about two, about a year and a half, I, I engineered that show. And by the time it was done, I realized that how many different styles of music blended into this musical gumbo, if you will. And we had, we had hillbilly music, we had black music, we had folk music, we had jazz, we had blues. We had, and I didn't realize that so many of these styles, these genres, were inherent to the black culture. Jazz, blues, doo-wop, wow. gospel. There's four major music genres right there that all of them combined make rock and roll. And yet all of them came from the African-American culture, if you really trace it back. Wow. So I started learning how to, almost like a, like a chef in a kitchen, how to put these musical things together to make music. And it was kind of an interesting thing. So long story short, again, I said that too much. No. Long story <laughs> short, I went from doing WLNR to finally going back to Hegwish and saying, look, uh, I'm ready now for the rock and roll thing. Well, it still wasn't, there still wasn't really an opening yet. So Joe, the owner, said, well, we had just started this thing called Night Rock News. It was a print spinoff. And they had done a couple of issues, and it was in the red. And I, I had taken some of my radio things I'd done and written some narratives. And now, mind you, I'd never written before, really, either. Um, and we did a couple issues like that. I, I took this script I was hoping to sell to radio, like a King Biscuit Flower Hour. Because even though I was 20, 21 years old, I thought I was all that and two bags of chips. <laughs> I was going to write the history of rock. So I did this thing called... and. Back then, we had no technology, so it was a thing called rock and roll in retro, spec, 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 spec. <laughs> you know, and I would do it like that and then throw a little echo on it, and it sounded very cool, very Twilight Zone. Oh, you'd, and, hit, you'd hit the, the, the echo, the reverb, yep. and then you would go yep. spec, spec, yep. spec. <laughs> yep. It was, <laughs> you know, it was quirky. Fantastic. So I was trying to come up with weird things to make it sound unique. Using and I would take what an you art. have, though. That's what I love. Using it, what I had. Using exactly. What had. Yeah. Which was very little of anything. <laughs> so I would take uh, some of the scripts that I'd written on Elton John, Bob Dylan, Elvis Presley, Alice Cooper. And I went to Hagrid's and says, How, you know, I can't sell these. I can't sell these anywhere. But I put all these hours into them. Can I take these radio scripts and write it, turn them into a narrative and, and you publish them as articles? And he said, sure. Well, they wound up being small books. I mean, there was so much detail into these shows. It was the history of this artist from birth to whatever their current single was nice. at the time. And so I turned them into that. They printed several of those. And I got the bug to write. It was like, oh, now I found another niche I like. Wow. Well, just about that time, Night Rock News was going into red. And Joe said, well, I think we're going to shut it down. I says, you can't. Please, God, don't shut it down. I can't get on the radio. Now you're going to take away my writing. What happened? Yeah, I got nothing left, and I was I was pathetic. I was just really wanting to grab that 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 brass ring somewhere, and uh, he goes, "I'll make you a deal." And and God bless him for this. He said, "I'll give you three months to turn this magazine from the red to the black. Start breaking even at least in three months, and we'll keep it. You're now the editor." Mind you, I had written three articles, so I went from being a, a, an English failure in school to writing three articles that barely got by to now i'm suddenly editor of a magazine Jeez. again right place right time right people in your life at the, at the right time so i met hegwish joe and all this stuff happened at, at the perfect time we wound up getting uh that going for a while that we turned it, it went into the black i started doing interviews um i wound up getting eventually on the radio as a kind of an assistant sidekick to kevin weber mm -hmm. who we called kid rock way before the kid rock but Kevin Weber was a long-haired dude that played the heavy stuff, and Van Pudlow was there, and Van was uh, into John Lennon and uh, the Birds and more of the softer edge, the California sound. Kevin was the hard rocker. Don Nelson, who went on to do a lot of stuff in Chicago radio, he uh, he was our program director, for lack of a better. He was like the, the leader of the group. And they finally let me on. And I, what I would do is I would combine the print and the radio, which is what I still do today. I would go to the Aragon Ballroom, let's say, and Judas Priest was playing. So I'd go backstage, and I'd take my little hand recorder, and I'd interview K.K. Downing of Judas Priest. And then I would race home as fast as I could, go to Crown Point, and I'd jump in the studio, because Night Rock was that. It was night. It started at 10 and went till 5 in the morning. It was an evening show, all-nighter. So I'd run home at 10.30 when the concert was over, 11, even leave early after the interview, and I get there, and I start cutting up my razor blade tape, and 
editing and Kevin would say, so Tom was at Judas Priest and how'd it go? Well, it was great. You know, this is what they played and that's what they did. And it was a full house. And, you know, after the show, I got to meet with KK and this is what KK had to say. Push the button. Wow. And here's KK talking. Oh. So, I mean, it was done on the fly <laughs> in every possible way before digital anything. So I learned out of necessity and eventually it grew into what I do. Suddenly, it's, it's funny how they each fed each other too. Exactly. You turn into a media mogul. What I like, <coughs> well, this, this air between the dogs barking and the, the leaves blowing, <laughs> I feel like every piece of grass is flying into my throat as I speak. I feel the same way. What's interesting, though, is, is learning so much just from that, that gospel experience, mm-hmm. it's, it's so interesting how now what you probably brought not only to what you would write or what, what you would say on the radio, you, know, you would have this, this vast well of well-rounded knowledge all of a sudden to whatever style was being put in front Mm -hmm. of you. And what I like about that is not only would you be able to present it in print or on the mic, but it probably gave you for the rest of your life this understanding internally of even just how to approach anything when you're you're either playing a song, how you're grouping the songs, you know, how you're placing things, maybe this How you segue the song. How you segue the song. You know, I mean, I would imagine that knowledge just... That, that bed of knowledge, because I think we live in a world where people just kind of get the basic knowledge of mm-hmm. something, face value, and then they're done. Right. But for you to have that deep well, I mean, I think that still serves you to this point. Oh, it serves me every day. Everything I do. So you're doing the night rock thing, and so we have a radio show, and then we have that, uh, then we have print. But then all of a sudden, when does your own magazine, The Beat, come into play? And It was called The, the Beat? M- Midwest well, Beat? Well, it the started beat? out... As the Iliana beat. Now, here, here's the very short trajectory here. Because, folks, the gentleman ended up having his own very successful Chicagoland uh, magazine. And what was cool, Tom, I have to say, everybody knows the Illinois Entertainer. Mm-hmm. And, which I also wrote for them. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Okay, now that's that, that was such a staple. And it was so awesome to see that any small venue or whatever venue I was going to, if you saw the Illinois Entertainer, you saw the beat right next to it. And pretty I, and, much. And it was pretty amazing. We were to in see three that. states. It was, it was fantastic. You know, it, and knowing that you know you you were you were kind of a one man show, and the Illinois Entertainer had a lot of things they had, going. They had on. an office and yeah. a staff. I worked in the basement. <laughs> and there you were, like you were side by side in the racks, and just as many people were grabbing your magazine, including myself back mm-hmm. then, as they were as, as the Illinois Entertainer. You know, but so yeah. The, now, how do you decide to do your own mag? Well, at a certain point, I left Night Rock and Hegwish. I got to the point I was running the magazine, and, and Joe was giving me a lot of freedom. I mean, again, the right guy. Joe was a really was really good to a lot of people, and he was really good to me uh, by giving me enough rope either to hang myself or to run with, you know, is either whichever was up to me to do. Yeah. So uh, I got to a certain point and we we started disagreeing on a couple of points and that was fine. He was the owner and, and funder of it and I had a couple more creative outlets, just like any band. I mean, you have a good run or management and artist and at a certain point you start having conflicting thoughts of where the, where the path should go. Yeah. And we left on good terms. It was all fine. I said, you know, it's time to move on. Now, in between that, right before that happened, he had formed a record label as well. And I was the, became the publicist of the record label. And one of the artists that I actually brought to the label and was responsible for signing was Deep River Band. So I signed them. And, of course, then we had Rock and Horse, John Consul, uh, who Linda Pappas had, or Walla at the t- or Pappas at the time, uh, had worked with John Contol as one of his background singers, one of the ways I knew her. Oh. Uh, so we had several. Joyce Faison was an R&B artist. Uh, there was a lot of different artists signed. But I worked with Deep River as their publicist. And then I left the whole organization, and about a week later I got a phone call from some gentlemen that ran a nightclub called The Point East. Point East was built as the ultimate disco. It was 1,600 capacity, three levels. They had a spaceship uh, for a DJ booth that blew smoke out, uh, dry ice. Uh, The actual dance floor was designed by the same guy that did Saturday Night Fever. It was modeled after that. I mean, top shelf everything. We had the largest, second largest laser light show in all of America next to the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Now, mind you, I'm 21-ish, and I get a call. Disco's dying. 
Okay. This is 1978, 70, no, 79. Okay. Disco, punk had already reared its head. New Wave was coming in. Disco was going out. And one of the first major shows they did there was Steve Dahl and Teenage Radiation, which was the Disco Sucks, Coho Lips, the whole bit. After that, Pointies went from the ultimate disco to the ultimate rock club. And the owners called me and said, look, you know, I had met them once or twice. We had done a few different disco era contests there with Hegwish as record sponsors. So I kind of knew them and they knew me, but we didn't know each other too well. And I got a call and uh, I think it was Paul that called me, Paul Hoffman, I believe, or Hubie, I can't remember. But one of them called and says, we're turning into a rock club. We know how to run discos, but we don't know much about live music and rock. We've asked around and your name keeps coming up on everyone's list. Would you be interested in helping us run our club? Again, I don't have any experience. I'm this kid from Highland. I'm like, yeah, I think I could handle that. <laughs> you know, all I knew was, you know, running the magazine a little bit and doing some of that. So I go, I take the job. Survivor was almost like a house band for us. The first time, if I'm not mistaken. Survivor. And, yeah. Wow. That's how Jimmy and I know each other. Jim Peterick and I have been friends for 45 years because... <laughs> I was a kid, and he had already been famous with Ides of March. I mean, he was a star. Well, Survivor was a new band. They weren't even, I don't think they were even signed yet. I, if I'm not mistaken, the first time Eye of the Tiger was played, like, in the clubs was at Point East. Wow. And I remember Dave Bickler, you know, somewhere in America, if she's out there, I wish she'd raise her hand, and everybody'd scream and raise their hands, you know, somewhere in America. And we got to be good friends, and they played there, I'd say, at least every six to eight weeks, something like that. Well, Scotty Brothers signed them. Long story short, they became a big hit. We had uh, the first date ever in Chicago with Iron Maiden. Third date in America, first date in Chicago was played at the Point East. No way. Uh, Paul Diano was the lead singer. It was the Killers Tour. We had the Plasmatics there. I've got a picture with Wendy O minutes before Cook County came in and took her away in handcuffs <laughs> because she had punched out a photographer on Lakeshore Drive. Again, I got a million stories, and if you come into <laughs> if you come into uh, Tom Lounge's record bin in Hobart, there is a mini museum it there. It is, it is, and there's a story behind every artifact from the from the vest that Waylon Jennings gave me to the signed Prince security to the postcards, birthday cards from Blondie. I mean, there's a story behind all of them. And I'm this happy is no to share. No joke, them. folks. If you go to Tom <clears throat> Lounge's record bin, you find it in Northwest Indiana. Find it, Google it, and find it. And it is walking into well, great. You have a great record collection there, which is great because you guys, you know, have some fun, uh, purchase some vinyl. But the sights and the sounds of the place. You have so many relics in that mm -hmm. place, including and me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so cool that that. Um, it's articles and it's pieces that you've gathered from your own travels. It's mm -hmm. not like you're a collector who went, you know, you. Yeah, there's very few things that were actually purchased. Most of them were given to me by the artists or the, I framed them because they were pieces of my history. Like the vest that Waylon gave me in 1988. It's now framed. Now, it's a little soiled because I wore it for two weeks while we were doing the shows. But I washed it, but it's still a little stained. But hey, it looks cool. It's worn. Well, I want to get passes. into the uh, some of your celebrity tales. Okay, but we're going to take the the one second eye blink for you folks. So you've got you've got a second to blink. Here's your blink. All right, that was your eye blink. Like I said, folks, we're we're outside, so dogs are bark barking, people are screaming at their kids. The hammock uh, is swaying. The hammock is swaying, <laughs> uh, and that was your one second eye blink. So a second for you, but it's like 15 minutes for Tom and I. We we picked weeds from the garden. And uh, that was about it. So uh, I want to jump into your, your celebrity tales, but I, but I do want to bounce back into the magazine as well as the record store because I feel like that cause I, it was kind of a similar timeline. So let's get back to the magazine just a okay, little bit more. I'll, I'll, throw the, I'll give you the real short version of it. Um, well, what I want to know is how does, a, how does a person without that much experience suddenly launch their, their own magazine? I'm, I, now, you got the inner workings. Right. But it's still a different world when it's all your baby. Talk well, to me about that. I was running, for the most part, Joe was financing okay. um, Night Rock. But he was running a record store. That was not his 
passion. He's like, we wanted to do that as a promotional tool. Same with the radio station. And folks, I need you to know that this was a magazine that would have, you know, major celebrities on the cover. There, there were major... No, we're talking inter- about Night Rock still at that point. Well, well, I'm even talking about once we get to the beat even, like I would see, you know, oh, you, well, you we'll, were able yeah, to... We'll yeah, to that. So I want you guys to realize that we're not talking... We are talking about, I guess, something with a, you know, a, it could be considered a small town magazine, but it, it eventually became a small town magazine that became, you know, a major publication in the Chicagoland area, which, you know, we're talking third biggest market in the country. Mm-hmm. So, all right, I just want to make sure that's what we're getting into, people. Um, but yeah, they, l- give me the tale. So we left Night Rock, and I had been running it for the most part. Now, Van was doing advertising. Joe was paying for it. I had never paid for it. I was very, very happy to spend money. <laughs> like, oh, we'll do this, we'll do that. Now, keep in mind, it's not like today where you've got a laptop where you can create and publish or anything else. To do a color photo, one color photo costs five hundred dollars because you had to do separate film and you did overlays. There'd be an amber, there'd be a cyan, there'd be this, there'd be that, and then your black plate. And then you had a you had to take these and process them, and then you would burn it to a a, a sheet of aluminum style metal. And then you put them on a press. If if you see the newspapers that run in the old movies where they run on the thing and they fall out and they grab one and they spot check it, mm-hmm. that's what we were. We w- I would sit and watch the press and I'd take sample issues until the ink didn't blur anymore. So it was the old school way. Wow. So it was very expensive. Very. one. Co- that's why most of them were black and white back then. Um, so long story short, I left Night Rock knowing a lot about running magazines. At the same time I was doing Night Rock, I was working for Imagine Magazine in Connecticut, Goldmine Magazine in Brooklyn, Relics Magazine, the Deadhead Magazine in, in, uh, I think that was the Bronx or Brooklyn, Uh, Prairie Sun in the Quad Cities, Uh, Hot Potato Magazine in Indianapolis. I was working for several. And I left there, did the Point East, still writing. So I started writing for all the glossies. I wrote for Hit Parader, Song Hits, uh, Teen Beat, Tiger Beat. Oh, wow. uh, Video Rock Stars. I was actually working for um, Word Up magazine, which is a a black magazine. Now, how do you blip on their radar? uh, How do you you expand to that point? Because I was a national magazine. Those were nationals. And it was funny because at any given time, I could go into the Walgreens or the Ryberty Drugs or whatever, the local drugstore, and on the rack, there'd be three magazines with my byline in it. (laughs) And I got a kick out of that. How I really did. How would you get did. to that point, though? Because I was able to get, I had a great, pho- I had a photojournalism partner, Linda Matlow, who did amazing photography. And she and I, we kind of needed, we were yin and yang. She needed someone to write. I needed someone to take pictures. And she was the best of the best back then. So we, uh, we teamed up and we started interviewing everybody. And because we had that, and she had some connections in other areas, and I had some connections, together we were like an unstoppable dynamic duo wow. of rock journalism in Chicago. So would you get, would you get a, a, a big interview, mm-hmm. I don't know, n- name someone, and then would you just shop that to those yep. magazines? I would that, shop it. Okay, great. And it's funny, because, and again, I'm, I'm getting away from where we were going with this, but it's funny because... For the teen magazines, and I'm going to burst some ladies' bubbles out there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we uh, go. <laughs> this, is a, this is a spoiler moment. Here's a scoop. Um, <laughs> if you were reading Tiger Beat yeah. or Teen Beat or Teen Stars or whatever the teen magazine of the day was, I would be writing. Now, mind you, at this point, I was in my early 20s, say 23 to 29 was the time I was working for all these glossies. Okay. And uh, I'd be out with... MC Hammer or uh, Duran Duran or whoever. And now, mind you, if you look at the teen magazines, 90% of the time, there's no bylines there. You don't see a reporter name. So I would be this 26-year-old guy, and I'm like, oh, wow, Simon LeBon is such a hunk. <laughs> you know, and these girls, when I tell girls that they're like, oh, my God, that was you? It's like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm writing to a 16-year-old market. Right. You know, right. I'm writing in a, in a 16-year-old girl mindset. So that's part of journalism. A lot of times you'd read these things and they were they were ghost written. It is so and I was funny a ghost writer. because they had to, <clears throat> you had to use that you know that jargon mm-hmm. and that's what's going to sell to that kid and that kid is probably thinking oh this this writer gets me yeah oh this I bet this writer's two years oh, I older hate than mail me. Hate mail from Warrant fans when Hair Metal came out I I 
dissed the first album, uh-huh. Dirty, Rotten, Filthy, Stinking Rich. Uh-huh. I think my review was Dirty, Rotten, Filthy, Stinking. Yeah, that describes it. <laughs> And I says, and yeah, they'll probably be rich. I think it was like a 10-word review. And they, what? Oh, my God. My editor, it was somewhere in in New York State, sent me a mailbag. Like you used to see in the movies where they get fan mail and bags. I got a mailbag full of hate mail from from snarky little teenage girls. (laughs) Who does he think he is? Blah, 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 blah. blah. At that point, I would have my name on as a reviewer because that was a review as opposed to a feature story that's amazing though that you went through that you know oh, yeah. that, i mean if one once so once you got into that steady stream i mean it just clicked start that's start, how prince came about start listing off kind of the rolodex i, I want to hear about the celebrities is, is there um before you get to somebody that maybe you truly respect because i'm sure there's there i actually some... respected everyone i talked to for oh, the most fantastic. part really? i really do because i may not understand or enjoy their art specifically but clearly they're successful and there is an audience for it. Now, that changed a little bit later when everything became auto-tune and this and that. Right. Back when I was covering this, you actually had to have talent. I mean, there's no denying MC Hammer, Vanity Six, Prince, any of these artists, yeah. Paul McCartney, you know, any of these artists I had the chance to interview or talk to, they had talent. Now, I may not like all their stuff. But that doesn't mean I don't respect them. I love the fact that you recognize that, and then that's going to come out in your writing. And that's because local, too. It's not that we don't have uh, amazing talents out there today. We do. We really do. But at the same time, there are a lot of people out there. That, I, I mean, with te- today's technology. They're playing the system. Anybody, you can play the system. And then not only that, anybody can sound good. Mm-hmm. You, you can auto-tune. They have real-time it's auto-tuning. It's more about the look. And the style that yeah. it is the music. Yeah. And that's a shame. That yeah. really is. So I love the fact that you experienced that. I mean, can you remember um, early on, what I'm curious about, I guess where I was going was, I, I, b- before we get to maybe somebody that actually maybe meant the world to you, you know, maybe maybe there was a dream interview, what I'm curious Few about of is any of, the, um, any of the big celebrities back in the day that you were that you were charmed by is there is there are there two or three interviews right off the bat that maybe weren't even that, that they weren't even people that you were a huge fan of but that you really thought wow that this was a this was a great time i wasn't expecting to have such a good time with this interview can can you rattle off a few uh, of those debbie harry and blondie no kidding became personal friends with them for a while through through debbie's uh mother Catherine now, harry what was it about debbie harry <laughs> <laughs> oh, is this going to get scandalous? Like, well, we uh, no, no, no. Like, it's, oh. not, it's just a funny story because, yeah. and it's a, it's a long one, so I'll, I'll just abbreviate it. Uh, if you want to hear the rest, come into the store, and I'll tell you. I'll show you the, a piece of stuff from her. You're like Rocky Balboa in Rocky Six. He he opens a restaurant, and people come in and they start asking, like, "Tell us about the Apollo fight." Exactly. People can do that now. Oh yeah, and they can. And buy they records. Happen, it happens every day. People oh. look at them. Tell me the story behind that. Long story, abbreviated here. Reader's Digest. We snuck into Debbie Harry's dressing room. <laughs> I was not allowed to do an interview. She was not doing interviews. I was determined because I'm all that and two bags of chips, mind you. <laughs> I'm going to get the Debbie Harry interview. I played the system. I knew a security guy who I dropped a dollar and said, oh, there's a dollar. Bye. I went up the stairs, snuck into her room. Great story, but it's long. So short story is we snuck into her dressing room after multiple possible getting busted moments Uh and uh as we close the door and go we did it we hear a voice behind us it says uh boys if you're gonna break into a lady's dressing room at least introduce yourself and as i turn around debbie harry is there with her short trademark skirt on and she's rolling up her nylons prior to the show getting ready to go on (laughs) and for the first time in my career and probably maybe one of two or three times in my whole career i was starstruck I wasn't ready for that moment. I was determined to do it, but at that moment, I was ready. I'm like, hamana, 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 hamana. <laughs> and her mom happened to walk in. So we, a long story is we wound up sitting down at the family table that night. It was at the Park West, and I got to be friends with Catherine, who was her mother, and we sat at the family's table with the family and now, friends. Now, hold on, hold on. I don't mind a long story. You're there. Mom walks in. To talk to me about what happened in that dressing room. What? What? what how did? How did it play well, out? Because you're nervous. You're there. She seems like she's being. Uh, you she know, was being very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Very approachable. Talk me through it a little bit. Well, well so we start introducing ourselves. And I'm like, Miss Harry. She should call me Debbie. So I was like, Okay, Debbie. 
I was trying to get an interview with you, and I, I snuck in. I'm sorry, blah blah blah. And she's <laughs> she's I'm I'm like cringing at this moment, waiting for security <laughs> to be called. And uh, she's like, "Oh, that's fine." She goes, I'm, "I'm really not in the mood to do an interview, but you you can stay and see the show." And I'm like, "Well, yeah, we got tickets." And she's like, "Okay, where are you sitting?" I said, "Well, we're going to be up, you know, by the bar in the back." And she goes, "No, no, you know." She goes, "Mom, uh, this is Tom, and this is his friend, and blah blah blah." And uh, do we have any room at the table? And I'm thinking the table. I was like, "Okay." So we go down, and we're sitting right like stage front center, and we're sitting with Catherine and her friends and different family members and wives of the band and girlfriends or whatever. And we got along so well that Catherine said, we love this, because I had magazines with me, of course, uh -huh. and this is a great magazine. Would you send it to me? And I'm like, sure. Now, there were a ton of celebrities that would get mailed the Beat magazine every month. Charlie Daniels, Tanya Tucker, I mean, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. would get this. Dennis DeYoung. Everybody got the magazine mailed to them first class. So Catherine says, would you mind mailing it to us? So I did. Well, we stayed in touch through Catherine. As long as Catherine was living, now she's long past, but we stayed in touch. Now, I used to get cards every birthday and every Christmas from Debbie and Chris Stein, Debbie, Harry, and Chris Stein. And most of them, I kept most of them. Sadly, in 2008, we had a flood. A lot of my memorabilia got destroyed. And then in 2010, my storage unit roof caved in from heavy snow. Ma. We didn't find out until like April when we went to go get stuff out of it, when the snow had melted and it was black mold everywhere. So 90% of my stuff got destroyed. Wow. I mean, heartbreaking stuff. Signed Paul McCartney stuff. Don't make me cry here. Oh, but, no. But uh, I had several things from Debbie. Now, the one that's hanging there, there is a little bit of a watermark on it. You can see where it's a little water stain, but it's it was salvageable. So I have an actual card on Blondie uh, Stationery that her and Chris signed. I think it was a birthday card. And she used to take a paper punch and paper punch out colorful construction paper. So when you open the card, it would pop in your face. <laughs> that's how she was. And... So I got some of those, and I saved them, and we put them in a little stopwatch. And it kind of signifies a stop in time for me, 1981, whatever it was at that point. And uh, so that's hanging there. That's and amazing, It's man. a fun story. And, yeah, we, used to, we mailed the magazine to them every month, and, and every once in a while I'd, I'd get to say hello. And that meant something because, you know, I, I was for, in love with Debbie Harry, yeah. as was everyone my age oh, in when the 1980s. She was, when she was on top of the world, yeah. She and was, she was so sweet. And her mom was an angel. Her mom was just an angel. And... Uh, it meant a lot. It I really like the did. the fact that uh, it obviously did because when I asked for a handful, boom, that that's what yeah. you shot out first. That's fantastic, man. Debbie Harry was probably the most impressive personal uh, enjoyment I ever got. You know, there, there was a few others that were lesser, I guess, uh, getting to do some shows with David Johansson. I was a huge, as a teenager, a huge New York Dolls fan. Huge. Okay. And when this is before Buster Poindexter and Hot, 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 and after the Dolls. So he was doing like Frenchette and uh, Funky But Chic with the David Johansson band. And I got to do a couple of different shows where I was covering that and interviewing him. Another is uh, Ronnie Spector. Ronnie was an amazing gal. Uh, and I've got a shot of, uh, she was a funny girl. Now you know, her she, stuff, she's really, because was her biggest hit first in the, was it 60s? Yeah, well that was Was that Be My X. Baby? Yeah, Be My be Little my, Baby. Be my, yeah, because, and then she, and then she was, you know, she was used in that other song, Take Me Home Tonight. Yeah. They brought her back Reprising in. Reprising the same thing. But she was this I worked classic. with her in 1980, I think it was Siren was her album. She was signed to Genya Raven's uh, Polish Records. Uh -huh. uh, Genya Raven was from Goldie and the Gingerbreads, another huge huge girl group of the 60s and Genya went on to become an executive producer record mogul things like that she's still out there doing stuff and uh i remember i think it was tuts i think it was tuts uh, in chicago where ronnie was playing and annie golden who was in the movie hair with treat williams i went to the red carpet stuff with that and she wound up uh they did a show together and i've got a shot hanging in the beat or in the in the record bin office or store of Ronnie and I standing there. And it's actually taken in the men's room. <laughs> and there's a big story behind that, too. And again, you need to come to the store to hear all this. Yeah, yeah. But uh, there's a couple of really good stories tied to this. So meeting Ronnie Spector. First, it's Ronnie Spector. Right. Come on. You know, anyone who grew up in the 60s that didn't love Ronnie Spector with the beehive bouffant hairdo, <laughs> married to Phil, you know, and it was funny. But uh, I actually got a kiss from her. 
and yeah. uh, which was immortalized. <laughs> and uh, just and that kiss stuff. is hanging up at the record bin. It and- actually is. <laughs> is uh, not that picture. That one's actually in a slideshow that runs in the case, oh, my cool. British Invasion case. Oh, nice. But uh, you know, Ronnie was a sweetie, and and Debbie Harry, and any uh, other starstruck moments for you? Because the, after a while, you get used to. The, you and know, honestly, the I didn't really. Other than Debbie, she's the only because I wasn't expecting to turn around and have her rolling her nylon right. up three feet from me. Yeah, there or you actually go. It was about ten feet. Uh huh. But you know, but Prince, uh, Paul McCartney. Wait, how did uh, you? I didn't know about the Paul McCartney thing. Interviewed. Him, well, actually, we did two press conferences. I shouldn't say I interviewed him. I was part of a press, press conference. conference. Fantastic. Um, and both of them were years ago. Linda was still living. Linda, his wife. Um, now here's why I want to talk about this because the people who are you know the everyman out here that's listening, you know, they don't get to do that. They don't know what it's like to be in a room, you know, with a bunch of reporters, mm-hmm. you know, in, there in line with a, a Paul McCartney. I, explain that. You know, what, what is that feeling? This was shortly after John was killed. So wow. security was unimaginable. You were wanted. You were patted down. You were, they, they, I think there was like 12 of us allowed in. And somehow Linda, who was my photojournalist partner, somehow she got us in. God bless her for that, because I don't know how she... That was on her. I mean, she got us in. Nice. And uh, we had so many good times. She is just an amazing photographer. If you ever get... Some of the pictures you see on my Facebook and stuff, uh, they're all credited to her, Mm because she is one of the best. But um, somehow she got us in, and we got to sit, and she was taking pictures, and I was one of those asking a few questions. And I knew that if anyone was going to get to shake Paul's hand that day, it was going to be Paul's friend and... Our colleague, Terry Hemrick. Terry, of course, does Breakfast with the Beatles on XRT. Yeah. I don't really know Terry. I've met her a few times, but she was there. And I'm like, I am going to be her Siamese twin. I am connected at the hip. I sat, I followed her. I was, now, I must have looked like a stalker. Tom, I'm aware of the Breakfast uh, with the Beatles show, but I didn't know that they knew each other personally. Yeah, she, well, I know she's had some correspondence somehow with him. I mean, uh, Paul knows who she is and she knows who Paul is, obviously. So you knew where to stand. I knew exactly where, she, I sat right next to her. When she got up, I got up. <laughs> and I, I don't think to this day Terry knows I, I did that. I mean, she, I was probably a blip on the sure. not even non existent radar. But, uh, you know, again, I didn't really know her, but I knew who she was. And I've always respected Terry as an air personality. And I'm like, and the fact that she is a Beatle expert. So I got a chance to, like, saddle up with her. It, 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 Paul was actually quite gracious. And he did come down as he was leaving, and he shook everyone's hand. He formed, like, a reception line. That's all I can really remember about wow, that. Wow, that's amazing. And then the second time we did a press conference, we didn't get a chance to really meet him. But we did a few moments, and then he was, he was I gone. I can't believe he did that to the press corps, though. He actually went and shook hands like that? Yeah. He was sitting at, like, a table, as I recall, kind of like what we were doing. And yeah. we were 10, 15 feet back. And, again, it was only a handful of people. Because security was extremely tight, and how we got in, I don't know, but we got in. And uh, but he came down, and he was getting ready to go behind the curtain and leave because Linda had come down. She goes, "We need to go. It's like showtime." Uh huh. And uh, but he was just starting to like do a okay, thank you for coming thing. But he was very cordial, even if you see him now on like Stephen Colbert. I mean, he's so cordial. Yeah. He's so wonderful. He's so non egotistical. I mean, Paul was just really nice. And again, I've had like what. 15 seconds of one-on-one with them, like, hey, Paul, nice to meet you. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> you yeah, know, that, that was like my personal experience that with him, but sitting in the room seconds. with him. How many people in the world, though, <clears throat> would love those 15 seconds? You know what I mean? Think about that. Put that in perspective. Another interesting time. And again, I'm jumping all over yeah, the decades man, this now. this is great. Another interesting time that comes to mind was hanging out on Elton John's tour bus and interviewing Nigel Olson, his drummer. Now, I wasn't there to talk to Elton. I was there to talk to Nigel, who had released some solo albums. Uh, Dancing Shoes was a single he had out. Oh. And uh, Nigel had two or three great albums out. So there's a picture of us sitting in Elton's tour bus, and uh, Nigel's wearing like half white leather, half denim. I'm wearing buckskin boots. I had long hair. <laughs> and I think there's an 8-track player behind us. Uh, the tour bus came with an 8-track player. <laughs> Uh, so there's some neat stuff like that that if I, and you know, I wouldn't remember these things really. There's so many, yeah. except I have the pictures. Now, if it would have been today's times and we all had a phone, you got to remember back in the seventies and eighties, you didn't carry cameras. Nobody carried a camera. The moments that I've lost that I could, the, the ones that were like, holy cow moments, you didn't have a camera. That's amazing. You have to it? rely on your memory. Yeah. And you it's know. almost like you're able to enjoy the essence more realistically mm-hmm. that way, you know? 
But well, you remember it. By looking at that picture, all of a sudden the whole day comes back to you. Let me switch over to, um, I want to get back to the magazine still, okay. but but at the same time, the record store, then you you owned a record, or you ran a record store. I mean, I don't even know. Okay, the records, you got to realize. When I met one you of the in the late, late 80s, I was a that kid. That was a Woodmar then. Yeah, I was a kid with a band, and it's so weird. It's uh, You were almost like, you know, in spy movies, there's always a person who runs the bookstore, mm -hmm. and then you'd go to the bookstore, and you'd, you know, you'd, you'd ask for, you know, you'd ask for War and Peace, but then you'd ask for this extra information, and you were like that guy. <laughs> I, I knew to come to you specifically to ask about, um, I think, like a, a, a way to get my early band, and that was before Timepiece, everything, into like a festival or something. Right. And you were like the guy, you know, I think I bought a couple of 45s too but it was just interesting you were this all-knowing guru who you know <laughs> did radio and magazine print and you were the and you, you, you had a hub at the record store yeah. it was crazy so how did that come to play well when i talk to classes and when i do lectures and things like that one of the things i always try to impart one nugget of knowledge with students always diversify same logic on wall street it applies to the entertainment business because the entertainment business runs in cycles, things dry up, things start again. I've always maintained print, radio, and retail. Because when one stops, you can move to the next and you survive. I've never had a real job in the sense of, I mean, I've worked harder than most people I know. I invest 24-7 into what I do. But as the old adage goes, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. I work harder than anyone I know, but I also feel like I've had a great life and I'm not really working because I'm loving this, okay? <laughs> so I teach that to the kids. It's like, learn everything. If I, if I do a lecture, like I did one at Valpo U for Music 101, I was able to talk about working for a record label, working uh, in a record store, working as a publicist, working as a talent agent, working as a, a writer, a journalist, working as a radio guy, working as a radio producer. These are different. I, now, I'm, not, I'm one of those jack-of-all-trades, master of none. I'm pretty good at all of it, but I'm not a master at any of it. And I will take my hat off to anyone that does that full-time because I learn from I learn every day. At 61 years old, I'm still learning Here's from everyone I talk to. Here's an interesting thing, too. Uh, everything that you've done that I've been exposed to has always been at a pretty high level. And it's interesting that you word it that way, saying maybe you're not a master of something, but the fact that you've you've made sure to that you've honed, and this is good for anybody in any industry, you've made sure to hone so many different crafts. But then it seems like the uh, the overflowing key ingredient is the passion, man. Mm -hmm. You have such a passion for music in general, and the passion seems to just go past whatever you know if, if you didn't take a, you know a, if you didn't take a, enough writing classes or as many writing classes as somebody who's writing for the New York Times you made sure you got to a level that's still a, a better than average mm -hmm. and then the passion seems to overflow and come through the piece and I've seen that in many pieces that I've read the you know? passion is what drives me and I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret I have no college degree never took a writing class in my life other than studying on my own, like I told you earlier, to get the license, I've never done any kind of radio formal training. And you're a great radio host, you know. I, I like it, it, the look of the record bin when I when I got to run over there to with my little band to um to do the your your show. Just the look of the bin, the way you the way you host a radio show. I mean, everything is done very well when you're in the midst of it. But I think there's something to be said for being in the midst of somebody who truly, truly gives all the shits about what they're mm -hmm. doing and that's you it really shows and it's amazing i learned a long time ago at point east when i was interviewing rick derringer and rick said i said man rick at the time rock and hoochie was the big song and i said rick you're like at the pinnacle you're you're one of the great guitar gods and he goes you know what i like to think i'm a really good guitar player and he goes but every guitar player i meet i ask him to show me something and if they want me to show them something i will he goes because you're one day away from being second place or last place. He goes, there's always somebody coming up the ranks that's going to smoke you. And he goes, so I learn from every guitar. He goes, it could be a local guy opening for our band. And I'm going to say, hey, I like what you did. Show me that. And I've always done that. I've always tried to learn from everybody that I meet. And uh, what I did is what you guys as singers and musicians do. 
when you're starting out, I'm sure you sang some Marvin Gaye songs or Stevie Wonder songs because that hit you, that resonated with you. Right. So when I started out, I looked to who my heroes were and I emulated them. I looked to Dick Biondi. I looked to Larry Lujak. I looked to Bob Surratt. Um, even as a writer, I used to read Triad Magazine, which was before you know the Entertainer and Triad Radio, Triad Magazine, which Night Rock was modeled after. And I would read the reviews, and I would write a review of my own, and I'd use this guy's style. Well, one of the guys I used to emulate as a writer was Kerry Baker. Kerry used to write for the Entertainer. Kerry's a dear friend of mine today. And he went on to become a publicist in California and do things, but I basically stole his style until nice. I developed my own. And I would start to emulate other people. When I first started emceeing at Point East, I was a nervous Nelly. I had done a couple MC jobs here and there, but now I'm hosting every night. I'm bringing on Humble Pie. I'm bringing Let's on Let's talk the about that because you do that so well. Where, where did the origin of that come from and how did you get it to where the it MC? is? The MC? Yeah. <laughs> Who, was there somebody that you were copping to at the, at the beginning? There is someone, that I, and you'd never guess it, because I was in the rock business, and I was dealing with heavy metal mostly at that time Okay, uh, at Point East. My go-to, when I first started to MC was Dean Martin. <laughs> really? You my know, there's mom, a cadence that I can almost still hear? Yeah. All, right, all right, wait a minute, explain. My, my mom and dad used to watch Dean Martin. I love Dean Martin. Yeah. And I still do. In fact, I just interviewed Dina Martin, his daughter, not long ago. Huh. And uh, Dean, to me, was the ultimate cool cat. I mean, he was, he was the, the bee's knees, so to speak. And I was nervous. I was extremely nervous to go up on stage and look at 1,600 people and have to introduce a celebrity and not sound like a complete fool. Yeah. So to Dean's honor, but also to my detriment, I didn't know what to do with my hands. So what did Dean do? He had a cigarette and he had a bottle. <laughs> so I had, I had a drink in my hand, a cocktail of some sort, usually a martini glass or, or a rocks glass with something in it, and I had a cigarette. So I started, re -sm I smoked a little bit in high school, but I never did it. Uh -huh. Well, I started smoking and drinking <laughs> by, by detriment because it was like it was a prop at first. And then suddenly I'm taking a drag and talking on the mic. And I'm taking a slug and I'm taking a drag and I'm talking. Well, it started becoming a natural thing. And I started smoking and drinking because it was my crutch to get away from emceeing. So I kind of owe that to Dean too. Uh -huh. Even though Dean, from what history tells us, never really was a drinker. He would, you know, pretend. That, that whole drunken thing, from what I was told, was, you know, an act. I've heard the same thing, yeah. So I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> so I became Dean Jr. But uh, he, to me, he was the ultimate swaggering, cool dude. And I wanted to be that guy on stage. So I'd wear my, my custom leather pants, and I had my drink, and I had my cigarette, and I would be cool. And uh, that taught me how to speak on stage. And I, I've emceed for hundreds and hundreds of shows over the years. Many give. at the Star Plaza. Uh, I did, when, when I was with You X, emceed at the Star Plaza a few I, times? Yeah. I did, what's that? At Star Plaza, really? Oh, I emceed a lot of shows at I the I would Star give Plaza. anything to hear like the first three or four especially if they were you know, hard rock concerts and metal concerts, because it would be hilarious to know how much you pulled before. You know, Like you said, we kind of pull so much from, from our yeah. influences, and then we become our own, and it would just be so funny There's to me. There's a live tape if, somewhere. I, 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 I just, in my mind, I just want to know that like the very first time you're like on a big venue and, and you're still trying to figure it all out, you're, well, uh, let's listen to Iron Maiden now. <laughs> <laughs> I would like, in my head, you're, boop, just, boop, boop, boop. you're just doing a whole Dean right <laughs> the first time. I don't know if I... I, I, I uh, Acted like him as much as I used his crutches. Yeah, yeah, and you that's know, that's clever. And but that was my my yes. source to well, go. My with thought that. is very funny, and I'm going to go with that for now. Like, okay. Uh, uh, well, see I, if uh, maybe Ozzy's going to bite that bat's head off again. <laughs> and uh, but he do. <laughs> well, when Point East closed in April of '83, um, you were asking about the newspaper. The club, yeah. So let's jump back. Yes. Uh, Night Rock had already, when I left, Night Rock survived for a while. It's not like they needed me. I mean, they did, but they didn't. They lasted for a while, and then they shut down for whatever reason. Well, point is, in April of 83, the laws changed. It was, I forget what it was, 18 to enter, 21 to drink, something like that. We were unincorporated. Then it became universal, 21 to enter. Well, a 1,600 capacity club could not maintain seven days a week. That's just too many people. So well, these are back in the days when there would be multiple shows all week long. Yeah, you yeah. could go to any bar seven days a week, and it was packed with a good band. Way before the days of today where you've got 
s- too many options. Yeah. Back at the peak, when I was at my prime, you had options as a as a person, as a human being that wanted to go out. You could stay home and watch network TV that at midnight would do the test pattern. Right. You could uh, go to the drive-in you movies. You kids out there, there were like three major channels to watch, and right. at midnight, those channels went off, and you'd yeah. hear like the Star Spangled Banner, and it was over. That so was So for it. you kids, yeah, imagine that, streamer, YouTube, yeah, TV, two in the Hulu, morning, there's nothing Netflix. on. Netflix. Maybe, maybe WFLD, which was new at the time, would run an old Zorro episode or something. On but other Friday than that, nights. Yep. yep. Yes. I When I was like in Zorro grade school, and Robin Hood. I, w- I would watch the Zorro uh, serials. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, so, you can't. It's back then, everyone went to nightclubs because you could go to the movies, you could go to the drive-in, or the or they didn't even have cineplexes then. They were just the local local uh, theaters. So you could go see a movie, you could watch network TV, or you could go to a nightclub. Yeah. There were no video games. There were no really arcades other than a few pinball arcades. There was no internet. There was no cell phones. There was no tweeting. There was no Facebook. Right. Imagine you're sitting at home. 90% of us were living with our parents. Nobody wants to be at home all night with their parents when you're <laughs> 18, 19, 20 years old. Yeah. So you would go out to the local club. So every single club had a top band. And you could go bar hopping to 15 different clubs in one night and not be disappointed. So when Pointies closed in 83, I contacted Van Pudlow, who I had mentioned was the sales uh, guy and DJ at Night Rock. And Van and I and Kevin and I, we all stayed friends over the years. Like I said, there was no real animosity when I left. It was just a time to move. And Van and I said, well, we should do this again. You know, the magazine's gone. Why don't we start it ourselves? I was running the editorial. You were doing the advertising. Maybe we could do this. So we started. It was called the Ileana Beat. It was a hand-drawn bass drum that said Ileana in it. It was the beat with the handwritten. That was terrible. (laughs) And we started Ileana Beat. Well, after a while, Van d- didn't want to do it anymore, whatever the reason was, and he he left after a year or two, and it just became The Beat. And I ran The Beat by myself for years with volunteer staff. And then when the internet finally reared its head and technology came to bite me in the ass, mm-hmm. I got a cease and desist order out of New York. There was a world music slash reggae African music magazine called The Beat that was a glossy, and it was a very well-done magazine. But they were called The Beat. Now, I had been publishing as The Beat years longer, but they had the trademark. That's where I started to learn music law because it's like, oh, boy, i got to change my name. Well, if I wanted to combat it because he issued the cease and desist, Uh I would go to New York courts, which is where he was based. And I thought, do I want to actually fight this? I'm a local magazine. And then I talked to uh, one of my entertainment columnists uh, who actually did a law column. And I was told, well, you know, all you have to do is change your name. And I said, well, I don't want to lose the identity. So we became the Midwest Beat. Wow, this is great. And that's how Midwest Beat And then you bet your ass I trademarked it. Yeah. No, so, that's so cool. Wow. That's why I still own that today. But, yeah, Midwest Beat, which is now the name of my radio show on, La- on Lakeshore, on NPR. It's uh-huh. called the Midwest Beat. That is some behind-the-scenes stuff I had no idea. I did not know that yeah. story, man. Yeah. So it's the things you learn yeah. along the way. And you, you, like I said, you learn every day. I try to learn something every day about my business. Prime example, we're opening our second store in Michigan City. Uh-huh. A, hopefully this weekend it should be. We've been delayed several times because of COVID, because right. of protests, because so of this, because of that. On. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the money we had plant, we had budgeted to open, well, we had to pay rent and pay nibs, go and pay things during COVID when we were down for 10 weeks. So all that ex- extra money such, went to pay bills. Such a tough time. So man. we are struggling to get finally open. We're almost there. In fact, as I sit here today, I've got some people working at the store getting it ready. But uh, one of the things I learned, small things, mm-hmm. our, our uh, case where we have uh, patches and buttons, band buttons, uh-huh. in the original store, I took my case and I put the thin uh, cork board in there. Well, it sticks, but it doesn't stick super well. So for the new one, I went and I bought that super thick 
chocolate brown cork board uh -huh. and then put the smooth cork board roll over it. Now I can stick pens all the way through and it doesn't even hit the back of the board. These are those little tips. Little to learn. tips. So yeah, now yeah. I know how to hang a damn rock button better. <laughs> 61 years old, I finally learned how to hang up a rock it's button. 45 years in the making, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. So little things like that that yeah, yeah, I yeah. learned from that store that I'm now applying to the new store yeah. to make it even better. Man, I'll tell you, the publication of uh, that, that Midwest Beat magazine, what I loved about it is that you had the power um, because, you know, you, again, I would still see... We had big uh, stars. Yeah, I would still see a relevant celebrity on the cover, but then you had no problem having a cover that featured local. a local group. And I don't even mean just a Chicago group. I mean local. a Hammond, Indiana yeah. group. You know, it was amazing. Oh, we had Jack Adams and Sergeant Rocks on the cover. They were big locals. And then two months later, I had David Bowie. But the fact that you you knew to to go out for the big interview and you cared about the big interview, and then lo and behold, I mean, the 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 group. Uh, Timepiece, the, the group. When I was in Timepiece, mm -hmm. they they had and uh, what a good band that was for those that never caught them. Boy, oh boy, we need a reunion I, show. That, just saying, <laughs> we should do a little something, <laughs> shouldn't we? You know, those were basically at first uh, the former members of my dad's old group, and you listeners know all those stories. Um, but uh, anyway, we you know we're kind of huge in the East Chicago market and hadn't tried to branch out yet because mm -hmm. I don't think they even knew how to branch out. They just knew their their group. We do a demo. At Sheffield Studios in Hessville, mm -hmm. we do a demo, and what I heard was that you were there, and you happened to hear the demo, and then you said, you know, well, who is, now who is this group? And then you came after us for a story. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, you know, we get this big splash page article. I loved the article. It's so great, because you went into the Enchanter's history and everything. Um, and, I mean, two weeks later, we're in different venues, and to me, in my opinion, you know, the phone started ringing a little faster, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, that band, which I always brag about because they brought that music into like places where maybe you know funk and stuff wasn't being played with right. at, at, at the time. Now it's all you know, it's a free for all. Every style is a free for all right. now. But the fact that you, it didn't even seem like. I mean, I'm sure there's a part of you that wanted to help a band out, but you just seemed so hungry. For a new sound, for a new thing, you know, and, and it just impressed me that that was that small at the time. You know, again, there could have been a major celebrity on your mag th the month before. The uh, problem or the, the, the thing about all the magazines, yeah, uh, when we're talking the local scene, whether it was Night Rock, Ileana Beat, Midwest Beat, whatever. And that's one of the reasons I left Night Rock. Um, and again, it wasn't bad blood. It was a change of direction. They wanted me to put somebody on the cover. And I thought this other band deserved it more. Well, I put the band I wanted on, and not, not remembering <laughs> that I wasn't paying the bills, mind you. <laughs> and that came to a headbutting. And it was, both sides agreed, okay. And in the, in the end, uh, I proved right that this band was more deserving because they became huge. But uh, the thing is, with the magazines, I had many people, and it's probably why I'm still where I'm at. I had many people and managers and bands come say, what's it going to take to get us on the cover? How much do I have to pay you to be on the cover? I'd say, I don't sell my cover. I don't sell editorial. You want to buy a full page ad. You want to buy the back page. You want to buy a center spread. I'll sell it to you all day. Yeah. You cannot buy my cover. If I don't believe in your music and your band and feel you're newsworthy, I'm sorry. You can spend all the money in the world with me, but that doesn't mean you're going to get a cover. I go back to that old school ethic thing. Oh, that's awesome. And today, you can buy any cover of any magazine. I still feel that's wrong, but I probably would still be in print today if I had done that, if I sold my editorial, but I wouldn't. That's amazing, man. That's but amazing. like I said, you know, Sergeant Rocks was a band. I believed in them. They should have been there with Motley Crue and Poison. They should have made it. Uh huh. Um, another band that used to do free shows for us back in the day with Midwest Beat, Disturbed. Oh, yeah, I remember that. They used to do beat parties with us. And God bless them. They five times platinum. And I got to thank you on that album with the sickness. It says, thank you, Midwest Beat and Tom Lounges, in the liner notes of a six times platinum album. Oh, that's fantastic. How cool is that? That's Enough's cool. enough. Oh, yeah. When oh I remember hiring Chip with his earlier band, We're Staying, 
at Point East. He came in with his little Beetle boots, looking very chippish, without looking quite as glam. Uh -huh. And he says, I got this band. And they were a really good band. And they were kind of Beatlesque at the time during the new wave scene. I thought, these guys are good. So we booked We're Staying. Well, Chip and I wound up becoming friends, and I got several thank yous on two or three albums. In fact, they played, Chip, Donnie, and Ricky Parent played at my second wedding as my wedding band. They came out and played right by your side when the curtains opened. <laughs> oh, it was a great. surprise. Um, so, I mean, the long-term friendships, you know, Jim Peterick going back, he just played at the record bin. And Jim I mean, Peterick is a legend. My God, he's written so many hits. He's won Grammys. I mean, the guy is phenomenal. Yet he came to Hobart, Indiana, and played an acoustic concert and signed albums for me. Now, is it true that he came in to do an interview and then it... It just turned into something even bigger because of the crowds kind of coming to the bin that oh, day. Oh, at the bin? No, well, it wasn't an interview. The Eyes of March had released their 55th anniversary album, uh -huh. vinyl and CD. Jim came in to do an album signing, old school album signing, like we used to do at Hegwish and Woodmar and all those stores back in the day. Rolling Stone Records did them. And uh, Jim always carries his guitar. I mean, come he on. He does. Oh, he always, at some point, it's somewhere in his car, in his back pocket somewhere. The dude that like wrote Eye of the Tiger yeah. still walks Hold around. Hold on loosely, heavy metal with Sammy Hager. The guy's written everything. So I remember he was in there, and, and basically you expect an in-store to be an hour and a half, maybe. Yeah. Jim was there for hours. He stayed until every single person there got their picture taken, got an autograph, whatever. And Jim said, he brought in his guitar and he goes, Turn on the sound system. And I thought he was going to do one or two songs. He did like a like a half concert. That's amazing. And he's got everyone in the store saying, if you look at the Live from the Record Bin Facebook page, uh -huh. it's, it's either Live From or Live At the Record Bin, the masthead photo, if, it's kind of grainy and dark because it was concert lighting, but Jim is all the way against the wall playing, and all these people are in there, and they're all singing vehicle. We're all doing ba da ba ba da with our voices <laughs> playing the horn parts. He is the most amazing human being. The amazing rock star that he is is so down to earth. Yeah. There are so few people that I have met in my career that I can say are are the guy next door. Genuine to the to the core. He is he is one of those people. That's refreshing to hear. But, but you know what? Jim and and Charlie Daniels is another. And so is Paul Rogers. Char those Charlie are my Daniels, three. Charlie Daniels, really? Yeah. Those are my three. If see, people say who are your favorite people you've ever interviewed or worked with? Jim Peterick, Paul Rogers, and Charlie Daniels. I did a USO tour with Stormy Weather. Mm -hmm. We went through all these NATO bases, and um, Charlie does a lot with that. You basically have to you you, you get the same fancy fancy tour bus uh, as the biggest the big star and the little star. They you know they have one thing that they're you know if you're going through Sarajevo that you know they're not going right. to buy two <laughs> buses. But, but when I got there, it, it was in NATO, it, it was in uh, Kosovo. But anyway, uh, in the mess hall. Uh, they were talking about other celebrities that would come through because you can eat. You're eating right with the troops, and they'd mentioned how uh, a certain celebrity wasn't all that nice. You know, oh, oh, I okay. have a few of those I won't mention, but yeah, there's a few that yeah. I can tell you off air. It, it definitely, it didn't go well. You're not one of them, though. Uh, good to know. <laughs> I appreciate that. My my skin was crawling. Like, oh no, uh, no, no. Uh, they'd mentioned. Um, a celebrity who came through and w refused to eat with them and was nowhere near them, you know. And then they said, before he was there, Charlie Daniels came out, and there wasn't a hand he didn't shake. Yeah, he's a good he old boy. He ate right in the middle of everybody, and he's chill. I mean, that's amazing to hear that story to this Charlie's day. Charlie's pure gold. Well, but but again, now I find myself fascinated with the spider web that you have because now that we're well aware of you know your prowess as a writer of everything music media, but I can't stop going back to this idea of how you didn't only go for the big wigs. It, it just blows my mind. Not only that you didn't do that, you know, I mean, I've been lucky enough. You've helped me in my career so much as a Chicagoland singer and, and writer and all that. But the fact that your spider web was so vast, the fact that you knew who you should be interviewing for the cover of a magazine or you knew who was hot. But then by the time I do my first CD, I was doing well in the area and I did a, a release party and I knew I knew I was going to do well, you mm -hmm. know, whatever it was, like 500 people. I knew I'd get about 500 people out. So I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to do this, 
um, I want to bring in some, you know, four or five other acts just to bring in duo versions. But who's good and original in the area? Who does who deserves to be seen by these people? Who deserves right. press? And I called you up, and you said uh, there's a girl named Nikki G. Oh know, yeah, who we all know as Nicole Nick Garza. Garza now. Yeah, and you know now she's a very you know a very successful. She's a, again, she's one of those that you just felt was going to be big. Yeah. And it's amazing, and now you know, and in her own right, you know, she's a businesswoman and a very successful singer in Chicago. Right? Uh, she's she's you know she's doing very well. But I had no idea who Nikki G was. As soon as I heard her, I thought, "Good Lord, that's a singer. That's yeah. amazing." You know. And then I I linked her into the Chicago scene that I'd been linked into. Mm -hmm. And now you know the company I got her with. She's with the Mothership Band of that company. It's right. great. But the fact that you knew. Yeah, I remember seeing her at a place called Andorra uh -huh. in Cherville. She was doing her Nikki G CD release party. Okay. And the only thing, I, and I don't know if she ever paid attention to anything I said, but the only thing I do remember saying to her, and maybe she listened, maybe she didn't, um, I said, Nikki G just sounds too hip hop. You are so much a broader singer than that. Yes, she is. You shouldn't limit yourself. Nikki G at the time, everybody was something G, something right. this. I said, you're kind of pigeonholing yourself. And I, you know, whether she took that to heart or not, or just said, you know what you're talking about, I don't know. But I always thought she should have used her name. And now, of course, she does. Yes. But because I thought this girl has soul. She's got depth. And not that hip hop doesn't have soul or depth, but it's. She's more than that. She's so much more dimensional. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad to see she's done that. Another artist I saw when she was 15, I think, playing at a place uh, in Lansing. Uh, name escapes me. It was a coffee house. It'll Elizabeth, come back. To maybe? Yes. Ah, thank you, Paul, right, Paul Celeste. And right, the on, uh, right, uh, right on Ridge Road. Our fact checker. Right on Ridge Road was a young lady named Tristan. Oh, I remember Tristan her. Tristan Gospoderic. Yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. I heard her, and I'm like, oh, my God. She's 15, she's writing her own songs, and then the cover she's doing, she's bringing her own personality to it. Um, I wound up putting her on at the Star Plaza Theater, opening for the original Guess Who Reformation Tour. Nice. So she got to play at the Star. Now, I had lost touch with her because I knew she moved, and, you know, things happen and you lose touch. I'm in Nashville this year. I'm going through record bins. What do I come across but a Tristan record on a major indie label? I bought it. I'm like, I knew her when. Fantastic. And so that's it, the thing. You care. I love this stuff. You care that much. And you're just going for the talent. I mean, I, th I think when it, when it comes to not only the Midwest Beat magazine, but I, I've, I've come to realize in this talk that when it comes to you, when it comes to your support, your love, and your backing, uh, nobody can buy the cover. Right. <laughs> nobody mean, can buy the cover. I mean, that's, that's you. One of the things that I've said many times, especially at Battle of the Bands, when I host battles, and there's a lot of artists that have gone on to do things that got their toe in the door at some of the battles I was involved in. And again, it's not about me. It's not me doing it. It's them having the talent and me shining a little bitty flashlight on them so somebody else can see them. Um, one of the things I say at a lot of the battles is I said, you know, we're going to hear a lot of young bands here today. Keep in mind... I don't. Who do you love? How many Beatles fans? How many Pink Floyd fans? How many Led Zeppelin fans? How many Janis Joplin fans? And they, you know, everybody raises their hand and cheers and says, "Keep in mind one thing: at one point in their career, they were a local band singing into a hairbrush in a mirror." And I says, "And today they're worldwide, and you love them. These bands today deserve that chance, and one day we may see them." On a big stage. Look at Disturbed. Look at Enough's Enough. Look at Sticks. Oh, that's fantastic. And I always man. try to bring that up to the battle because yeah. I think. Even though they're raw and they're baby bands, so to speak, they deserve to have the attention. If you're there and they're on that stage giving it their all, they may be a little rougher on the edges, but you deserve to give them the respect because they're up there doing it. And one day we can say, we were there. I can say, I saw Tristan at 15 years old. I had a cup of coffee with her. That's huge, man. You know, to me, that's what it's about. When I went into Nashville, I haven't talked to Tristan in years. Uh -huh. I don't even know how to reach her right now. I suppose she's on Facebook. But when I went in there and saw a vinyl record with her name on it, and I looked at it, and I asked the guy, I says, is she local? He goes, she's from this area now. He goes, I don't know where she's from. I says, well, she's from Chicagoland. He goes, yeah, she's pretty big out here. And I'm like, damn, yes. <laughs> you know, you get that. 
Yeah. You know, King Kong pound your chest thing. I, I saw her then. Melissa Etheridge. You know, I've got a signed flat. Now, for those that don't remember the old vinyl days, a flat was an album cover before it was a cover. It was the artwork. It was just one sheet of cardboard. Mm -hmm. And the labels would hand those out to put in your windows as a record store six months before the album came out to get a buzz going. I have a flat of Melissa Etheridge's first album, the Red Album, and I have an invitation a hand-done invitation kind of thing that invited me to come meet this new artist, Melissa Etheridge, on a cruise of the Chicago Star or one of those things. And we went on a cruise, and she was completely unknown. And she sat barefoot in the middle of the boat and played uh, Janis Joplin songs as well as all the songs from her forthcoming album, and we had like a luau on the deck. Wow. And that's framed and hanging in there, too. So uh, we all know what happened to Melissa. <laughs> she did you know, okay. There's some monster talents out yeah. there. Dennis DeYoung. I mean, Dennis and I stay in touch. Yeah. We're, I wouldn't say we're bosom buddies, but he knows my name. I know his but name. Again, and when you, he's you, got new stuff, I mean. You cared. And because you cared, you, know, you held people along the way. You know, And there's you, a level of respect. I have never, ever been one of those journalists, and I use that term loosely in this case, that want to sensationalize, expose, tabloid. Jerry Schilling is an author. Jerry Schilling was one of the original Memphis Mafia with Elvis. Mm-hmm. I am a huge Elvis fan. Elvis was responsible for getting me into music in many ways. Another long story, some other day we'll talk. Okay. But uh, I have worked with almost everybody in some way that worked with Elvis, except Elvis himself. <laughs> nice. Now, when Jerry put a book out a number of years ago, he told me, he goes, oh, I saw your name. He goes, I had lunch with Lisa Marie the other day. And he goes, uh, I saw on her list your name. And he goes, oh, I'm going to talk to him. She goes, he's one of the few people I'll talk to. So I'm on a very short list, according to Jerry Schilling, that Lisa Marie will talk to. I've interviewed her three times. Nice. And she doesn't do a lot of interviews. And one of the things that I think she respects the most in all our talks, I've never asked about her dad. As far as creativeness, I've never asked about Michael Jackson, Nick Cage, or any of that shit. I ask her about her music, her writing, and what her goals are. Because I don't care about Michael Jackson and the famous Kiss or this or that. To me, Lisa is an artist. I love her music. And when you're talking to her, you're talking to her. To the artist. I'm not talking yeah. to Elvis's daughter. That I'm talking means, to the artist, Lisa Marie. That means everything to her. You know. And she, you know, I, I've heard she's difficult. Now, she's never been difficult with me. And but there's a lot of reasons why she could be difficult. Exactly. If everyone's coming at her with everything but her, yeah. and then she's suddenly a, a deflector or an answering you know, person. Nobody wants to talk Nobody about wants, that. Yeah. You know, he, Julian doesn't want to talk about John Lennon. Right. You know, Colin Peterick doesn't necessarily want to talk too much about his dad. I mean, they work together well, but he wants to talk about his music. And that's just some of the things, you know, when I talked to uh, Greg Allman's son on the Allman Betts thing. Yeah. One of the first things he said, is he's, he's like, I'll answer two questions about the Allman Brothers. <laughs> and I'm like, good, because that's about all I have. People, not only that, I, I, can, I can speak from experience, too, and that's what I like. I like the fact that what you've done, uh, it, it, it runs the gamut of levels of success for people. And, you know, I, I'm doing all right. And I know that if I don't have, you know, either great band people around me or certain influences, but if I don't have a Tom Lounges in my life, I'm not doing as well as I'm doing now because, you know, there you covered that band way back when that put me you know, on the map with some of the other groups. And then mm-hmm. you covered the one, the, you know, my most successful CD out of the three, the the one that got the Chicago land attention. And, you know, even, even now with my new journeys, like it's, it's just so interesting that I can, I can, I can tell everybody what you've done for people and what I've seen you do, but I can say it as somebody who's also been affected by that, and I have to personally thank you for that. You know, and I want you to know that that's another reason I, I wave your flag because it's like that those old like hair club commercials. You know, not only am I a vice president, <laughs> but I'm a member. It's true, and if I could be so bold as to say, you know, your spirit, your kindness, what you've done. You know, uh, maybe we can't buy your cover, but you've you've bought our cover, you know, Mm -hmm. just because of who you are. And I respect the hell out of that, man. And before we go, though, there's one important aspect about the record bin that I want to talk about. And this is really cool. I'm imagining that it's the new one's going to be similar to the one uh, the one that I went to. 
I, I did a show, brought some of my original guys in there. It mm-hmm. was a great time. And not only was it a museum, not only was it filled with all these, these, just the paraphernalia was great. But besides that, and obviously the records themselves that you can purchase, um, when it was performance time, there was lighting, there was a sound system, it was geared up and it looked cool. Yeah. And the fact that your record store suddenly truly turned into a concert venue was awesome. And is that something we're going to see at the new one that More you're opening? So. More so. What More do you mean? More so. Uh, at the new one, it's a bigger location. It's okay. a former restaurant. Um, I have had built a stage. It's 9 by 16. It's not huge, but it's big enough. It's about 11 inches high. It serves during the day as an up section in the store where the clothing racks will be, because we're going to have clothing. Okay. And when it comes time to perform, once we get through the whole COVID nightmare, yeah. and people are back inside performing... Those clothing racks are all on wheels. They will be wheeled off to another part of the store. We are going to have a house sound system. We are going to have house lights. And we will be able to seat about twice as many as the Hobart store. It's fantastic. And it will hopefully, and I don't want to jinx myself, but the goal at this point and what we had ready to go until we lost all the money to Mm -hmm. 10 weeks of being down was... um, at the Hobart store, we have Region Radio, which Rich Warren has created, and we have f- like six stations, each one independently run Great. by different people. Lowell High School has one, he has the Bulldog Country, and I do Midwest Beat, which is basically the old Night Rock format with more local and some blues and a little bit more added. Nice. So that's what you were on. What we do with the live shows in Hobart, is when it comes time for band time. We don't bill it as a, as a concert or a live show or anything else. We bill it as a live radio show with an audience. The station is licensed. The artist, it's not so much you're coming to a concert. You're coming to see a live taping, almost like a sound stage. Oh, that's awesome. But on a small scale, and it's strictly audio. Now, we do run Facebook videos, things like that. Anyone's welcome to bring their streamers in. But we actually have a great sound system in there. That patches through fiber optics to the front soundboard, which is the radio one. So the live sound goes through the ceiling into the radio board, then broadcasts to the world. Oh, very cool. It's completely licensed through CSEC, which gives us an international market. We've had a lot of famous people, a lot of local people, a lot of local choir kids. We even have an open mic in which we've had a four-year-old play guitar. Um, (laughs) And it's always broadcast live. So the goal, when we get the new store in Michigan City up and running properly, Uh will be to, I want to create, through Region Radio and through my friendship with Rich and Rich Jennings, Rich Warren and Rich Jennings, a new station. The one here is called Midwest Beat, and that's also the name of my show on NPR. Michigan City is a little bit more of a diverse market, multicultural. I want to make a new station, a separate second station that I run, and it's going to be called, if all things, all cards play, it'll be called Midwest Groove, and it's going to be a little more in the Motown, blues, R&B, jazzier rock so you're going to hear everything from parliament to marvin gay and the temptations to muddy waters to uh average white band blood sweat and tears ides of march horn driven funkier stuff uh blue-eyed soul like the righteous brothers maybe or hall and oats it's going to have more of a groove as opposed to a guitar driven sound and that's the goal here and we have built a dj booth (laughs) <laughs> there is an actual fiberglass, or not fiberglass, plexiglass DJ booth. Well, the way this show is run is people will be listening to this uh, forever and ever and ever. It's strange how people have binged this this show. So now you guys know, uh, whenever you listen to this episode, just Google Tom Lounges. You know, just just find Tom Lounges. Find Tom Lounges record bin. Find t- if you look up look up Tom Lounges radio. Just just look up his name. And because I can promise you, if I know you, every five years, two years, three years, whether it's 10 years down the line, whether it's tomorrow, you are always going to be involved with something new. It's something exciting. It's something that you're passionate about. and because, Keeps me young. And because you're passionate about it, we're all passionate about it once we experience it. And I want to thank you not only for what you've done for me personally, but for sitting outside and sharing the story with the audience. Man, this is a long time coming. And I think you... And we've only 
scratch the surface. You see what I'm saying? And, and you are <laughs> you're you're a gem to the industry, man. And you're so you're something that that people forget they need so badly. And I just want to thank you for everything that you've done, continue to do, and and just for being who you are, man. Thank you. Thank for you being very here. much. Yeah. So Tom Lounges, any last plug you want to? Uh, Tom Lounges Entertainment dot com. All right. Tom Lounges uh, Record Bin dot com and all over Facebook. There you have it, folks. So you love him, you know him. There he is, Tom Lounges. Have a great time. Thanks for spending the day with us. I hope you had fun, Tom. Good As times. a chatter of fact, I did. Uh, <laughs> how is it nobody's been clever enough to do that? <laughs> Over 50 shows, no one's done that. Well played. Oh, you see that? That's what happens when I'm like across from media greatness. You see that? You see, I still have something to learn. So <laughs> thank you, Tom. Everybody, you be safe out there. Uh, have a great day. Have a great week. Have a great month. Have a great year. Go out and find your smile. That was awesome, Tom. <laughs> Man, that was so great. Those stories... The story. Welcome to my life so far. You think by now I'd be a star. I may be long winded, but hey, there's just so much I have to say. Maybe lick your lips when you're hungry. Maybe drop your head when you're sorry. Maybe shake a bit when you're worried. That's 